Hey everyone, Turf Teacher here. Just wanted to do a short intro for 2187 Landscape Contractor Accounting. As you watch the lecture, you're going to notice that the check on learning questions that we've had in other courses, these don't match up. And so instead of recording the entire lecture over, I'm just doing a short clip at the front and end of the main lecture. As you can see, here are the questions. We have, what is the turf teacher's accountant's first name? We have, what is the name of the turf teacher's dog? And then last but not least, what year did the turf teacher have his heart attack? And so watch the lecture. And at the very end of the lecture, you will see the answers to these three questions uh, so that you can get a good score on your quiz that will generate your proof of attendance. Thanks, and I'll see you at the end of this lecture. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the course entitled Landscape Contractor Accounting. This course has been given course number 2187 by the North Carolina Landscape Contractors Licensing Board. This course is good for one business credit for your 2022 license renewal, which is due or needs to be completed by July 31st, 2022 at midnight. So this course is good for one business credit. Uh, this course has not been approved by the North Carolina Department of Agriculture for a pesticide credit, nor has it been approved by the North Carolina Irrigation Contractors Licensing Board for one business credit. Hence, the title, Landscape Contractor Accounting. This course is only good for North Carolina Landscape Contractor Licensing Board credits. So, guys, this is a PowerPoint put together uh, based on, you know, traditional accounting and business practices. Uh, some of it we implement, others I know we should implement. Uh, it's just one of those things. So, let's go ahead and get started. We're going to start off with our objectives. And before we jump into the objectives, we are going to have some check on learning uh, for you guys to answer on the quiz. So after you watch the lecture, there will be a 10 question quiz. Uh, if you pass the quiz with a 70 or better, you'll be able to download your proof of attendance for the uh, uh, licensing renewal. And on the quest on the quiz, there's going to be, you know, seven or eight questions that are directly related to the content in the lecture here. And then there's going to be two to three questions that are what we call check on learnings, where you actually have to watch the lecture to get the answer to the questions. You're not going to be able to scroll through or, or, or kind of guess at it. You're going to have to watch the lecture and do it. It's, you know, what the board wants so that they know that you guys are watching the, uh, uh, the lecture. So uh, they're called check on learnings and I'll tell you when we're getting ready to have one. But our objectives, we're going to talk about bookkeeping. We're going to talk about the accounting cycle. We're going to talk about methods of accounting. You know, there's, you know, three or four methods that we can use for that. We'll talk about contract accounting. We'll talk about cash management. We'll talk about equipment records and accounting. We'll talk about the accounting process for materials, payroll accounting, and then technology solutions for accounting. And there's plenty of technology applications out there, guys. And when we say the word technology, technology can be analog or it can be digital. You know, uh, analog is the good old handwritten filing papers, uh, you know, that that traditional system. I know a lot of you guys are more apt to do that. Uh, and then there are a lot of you that do the technology or the digital side of the house. Either way is fine. Just whichever way works for you. But just know that there's technology for both analog and digital. Then we're going to jump into uh, employer identification number. What is an EIN? We'll talk a little bit about federal business taxes. We'll do a summary of federal tax forms. We'll talk about income tax, self-employment tax, federal employment taxes, penalties, information returns, 1099 miscellaneous forms, um, you know, that you should only be given to contractors that you subcontract out. I don't like seeing any employer hire people with the intent of giving them a 1099 it's it's not right guys you need to have them on payroll and let them be a w-2 employee not a 1099 
When it comes to 1099s, you can't tell them when to show up to work. You can't say be here at 8 o'clock. You can't say that you have to do it this way. If you're giving someone a 1099, there are specific rules that they are allowed to use. They are set up as a independent contractor. So if they want to come in at 9, they have that right. You know, the only time you can tell them to be there at 7 o'clock in the morning is if you are giving them a W-2. They are an hourly or salaried employee, not an independent contractor for you. We'll talk about a tax calendar when certain things are due, and then we'll talk about North Carolina state tax pacifics or specifics. People always make fun of me. They call it Pacific instead of specifics. Uh, My students at the college always make fun of me for that. But let's talk about bookkeeping. You know, bookkeeping, the first step in the accounting process is bookkeeping. And so we're going to talk about these tips right here. But guys, you need to have that individual that works for you, that's on payroll, that manages your everyday bookkeeping. And if you're not to that point yet, you probably need to have your CPA or your accountant do this for you at least on a monthly basis, if not monthly, definitely on a quarterly basis. You know, you save all your receipts, you track your expenses, and then you give them this paperwork and they can, you know, produce these forms for you, profit and loss statements, and tell you whether or not you're making any money or not. Um, but if you, if you, if you don't have that person on staff and you're trying to do it yourself, you're going to get burnt out. I did. I, this is the one aspect of business that I don't like, but I know it is a valuable, important piece of the puzzle. It is one of many hats that we wear as business owners. And I like the fact of just trying to, you know, have people help me do this. And if I'm not having people help me do it, I'm definitely going to embrace every piece of technology that's out there. And I'll talk to you a little bit about that as we go through the lecture. But First thing we need to do, I know a lot of you guys are operating as sole proprietors. Uh, some of you are in LLCs, C-Corps, uh, partnerships, whatever it is that you're doing. Those are your business entities. But however you're running your business, you need to have a separate business checking account and a separate business credit card. Now, day one, we've always had that business checking account. Occasionally, I will use a personal credit card just to order some stuff. You know, just like when we had the ice melt, you know, we ordered a bunch of ice melt. We were calling all over to places trying to find it this past winter because we had the ice storms and we didn't have accounts set up with these people. So we had to use credit cards to get it and get it shipped to us. And I put it on the personal credit card. So, you know, that's the one time I've done it. I shouldn't have done that. I should have kept everything business. But, you know, there are times that we do that. But that's piercing that corporate veil, and I don't like to do it. But keep track of all deductible expenses, you know, gas, you know, oil, uh, labor, your materials for jobs, everything that you can deduct, you need to keep track of. Save those receipts. I finally bought one of the receipt scanners that scans like 30 receipts in per minute. So I will, you know, put them in a box, you know, for the week, or I'll try to do it daily if at all possible. If I don't do it for the day, I want that to be my first task the next morning, closing out the books for the previous day. I like the way restaurants and a lot of retail um places do their books. They close their books for the day every single night and they make monthly deposits. Now, we're not going to make monthly deposits because we're probably either billing through, uh, you know, handwritten uh, invoices or through QuickBooks, which we email to the clients. So they either pay us online, which automatically goes into our, you know, checking account or they're handwriting us a check and mailing it to us. So we're not apt to drive to the bank every single day, but we probably at least need to have a day of the week that we do our banking. Uh, But keep all receipts and identify the source of all receipts so that you can uh, separate your business from personal receipts and taxable from non-taxable income. Now, with that, that's why I love that little scanner. Uh, it does the trick. We can scan it into folders. We can put it on a thumb drive, but we can separate it and assign it to jobs in job folders. Uh, it'll also uh, connect with our QuickBooks as well. 
But update business records daily. That's what I was just talking about. Have that individual that works for you, or at least try to do it yourself, to have a quick access to the daily financial position of your business. So if you've got several thousand dollars in your checking account and you go and you pay some bills, you need to balance that checkbook you know, daily. You need to record those receipts. That way you'll know exactly what's in that checking account way before, uh, you know, they get to the, to their bank and deposit that check and you see that it's gone later. Um, update accurately record all information in a checkbook ledger. It's what we were just talking about. I think it needs to be done daily record expenses when they occur so that you have an accurate picture of your cash situation, avoid paying with cash so that you uh, don't have a paper trail of your expenditures. I don't ever have to worry about having cash because I have three daughters that'll go through my wallet and take the cash that's in it. So I'm just used to not having cash. So I've got to use a business check or business um, debit card. Balance your checking account monthly. I recommend doing it daily, guys. You know, if you're writing two or three items, it doesn't take you long to do that. It's better than waiting to do it at the end of the month. But if you can't do it daily, at least do it weekly. But, you know, the experts say that you need to do it monthly. I, I like doing a reconciliation monthly and just kind of going through it and making sure that I haven't left anything out and, and uh, you know, just making sure that I'm exactly where the bank says I'm at. Keep all financial records for the required amount of time as designated by the IRS. And usually that's going to be, uh, you know, seven years. And I'm tired of keeping all that mess. That's why we got that scanner. You know, from here on out, everything gets scanned in and saved digitally. We can empty some of those file cabinets and have a burn party one day. So with the accounting cycle, step one, you need to classify and record transactions. Daily transactions are recorded in a set of books called journals. Now, you know, these journals don't necessarily have to be a book. You can set up an Excel sheet or you can track it through QuickBooks. But typical journals are going to include cash receipts and sales. Uh, this is used when cash comes in from a sale and is charged to a customer. Uh, purchase journal, this tracks all purchases made by the company. Cash disbursements is used when cash is paid out. Your payroll journey used to record a summary of payroll details such as salaries, wages, deductions, and employer contributions. Now, to simplify your payroll journal, I use a payroll service. It's ADP. I'm not sponsored by them or, or promoting them or anything, guys, because there are several companies out there. ADP just works with us. I like it because I can pick up the phone and somebody's going to answer it. Or if I'm logged into my system, somebody's always popping up in the chat box saying, hey, Mr. Jones, can we give you any assistance? But all of this payroll information is saved on their system. And all I've got to do is print it out for the accountant. Like here's, here's, you know, this month's payroll, here's the quarterly payroll. He's got all of this information right there and it, they charge a $65, uh, each pay period. So I'm spending what 280 bucks a month on somebody doing our payroll. That's cheaper than having someone in the office. I love it. And we will always, always still do payroll, uh, through an outside company, uh, general journal. And he's used for non-cash transactions. So I guess, you know, if you uh, use a credit card, you're going to bring that receipt in. You can write it in that journal uh, or type it in there and then scan in that receipt. So uh, a lot of duplication there. You know, you guys can work on your own system, but these are things that need to, to be kept. However you do it is totally up to you. Uh, step two is post the transactions. Posting is the process of transferring the transactions recorded in the journals to the appropriate accounts. An account is a register of value. Most companies use five basic types of accounts. Asset, liability, uh, equity, income, and expense. Asset, let's say, is your truck. Uh, the loan that you have on the new truck is the liability. What you have uh, in cash value from the truck, let's say you only owe 30000 on it and it's worth fifty. dollars uh, you know, you've got $20,000 in equity. Income is what you're bringing in. You're using that dump truck on someone's property, hauling mulch and stuff, you're bringing in income. An expense would be the oil in that truck, the gas in the truck, your labor, and the mulch used at that job. But you're going you're gonna to post most of this stuff in these five accounts. 
Step three, you're going to prepare a trial balance. The trial balance is a total of all the ledger accounts. And then step four, you're going to prepare an adjusted trial balance. There are six general types of adjusting entries. Prepaid expense, you know, maybe you're pre-purchasing your fertilizer for the year because site one has a, uh, you know, pre-purchase discount if you order in December. An accrued expense, accrued revenue, unearned revenue, estimated items, and inventory adjustment. Your inventory is going up and down, especially in lawn care. You know, you're buying products, pesticides, fertilized, that stuff is going to go up and down. So they are going to be adjusted. Step five, prepare financial statements. The three basic types of financial statements that companies use are the balance sheet, income statement, statement of cash flows, and notice or notes to financial statements. With your balance sheet, this gives the owner a good insight into the growth and stability of a company. A lot of the times, bankers are going to want to see that as well. Your income statement, a summary of the company's revenues and expenses over a given period of time. So you could do an income statement monthly, or you could do it weekly. Statement of cash flows. This summarizes your current cash position, your cash resources, and use of these funds over a given period of time. Note that the, these statements, these past two statements, is over a given period of time. So they can change week to week, month to month. And then notes to financial statements. Relevant information with no specific place within the financial statement. Um, So, you know, this could just be general information that your accountant may want to pull out for you. Step six, analyze financial statements using financial ratios. We have current assets divided by current liabilities is your liquidity or what they call the current ratio. Uh, You'll hear people talk about liquidity, you know, especially a lot of stockbrokers and stuff talking about the the companies that they're trying to get you to purchase stock from. They'll talk about the, the liquidity of it. Current assets minus inventory divided by current liabilities is your quick ratio. Your revenue divided by the days in the business year is your sales per day. Your current receivables divided by sales per day is your average collection period. Your total debt divided by total assets is your debt ratio. Your net income divided by your revenues is your profit margin. And then your net profit after taxes divided by total assets is your return on total assets. And these are a lot of uh, statements that your accountant can help you with, and they can produce these statements fairly quick for you. Now, it doesn't necessarily have to be a CPA. There are bookkeeping companies out there, but, you know, they usually will employ a CPA. Uh, But you can have somebody that is, you know, sharp with these business these business formulas here that can actually be of value to you. So, but I still guys, I love having the accountant do this stuff for us. Um, we try to get him uh, the information so he can do it quarterly for us. We were going to do it monthly, but he's like, Eric, I think with, uh, you know, what you guys are doing, I'm fine doing it quarterly. So we gather all this information and give it to him. And then he can produce these forms for us. I'm not spending the time to do it. Mr. Moser is doing it for us. Now, with methods of accounting, there's cash method and there's the accrual method. Cash method is reported income in the year you receive it and deduct the expenses in the year you paid it. So, you know, let's say you bought, let's say you bought all that fertilized. It becomes an expense this year. You prepaid for it. Well, you're not going to use that fertilized until the following year. You're going to uh, deduct the expenses in the year that you paid for them, but you're going to count that income the following year. So you may not have as much, um, what you say, deductions the following year. But the reason you pre-purchase this anyway is because your accountant's probably told you, hey, you need to spend a little bit of money. With the accrual method, you recognize income when the services occur, not when you collect the money. And then changing your method of accounting. Once you have set up your accounting method and you file your first tax return, you must get the IRS approval before you can change to another method. Now, there is also the contract method, uh, uh, contract accounting method. And most construction businesses will use two tax accounting methods, one for their long-term contracts and then one overall method for everything else. The choice of your contract accounting method depends on the type of contracts you have, 
your contract's completion status at the end of your tax year, and your average annual gross receipts. Now, guys, what we're talking about, uh, you know, if you are a home builder or commercial builder, we have a general contractor's license in our landscape contracting business, and we also have another GC license in a home building business. And two different types of accounting. Because in the GC company, we may have a contract that may last a year and a half, two years. We may have a short contract as well. So this is what we're talking about here. And my accountants always, always wanted us to do this for the homes that we've built. It's called completed contract method. This is when income or a loss is reported in the year that the contract is completed. Disadvantages of the completed contract method are the books and records do not show clear information on the operations and income can be bunched into a year when lots of jobs are completed. Losses on contracts are not deductible until the contracts are completed. Completed operations. Now, there is also a percentage of completion method, which recognizes income as it is earned during the construction project. Then there's the cost comparison method, an approach that combines the completed contract and the percentage of completion methods. Percentage of completion times the contract amount is equivalent to your cumulative earnings. Your cumulative earnings minus the amount billed to date is your billing overage divided by your deficiency. So with with commercial projects and and contracts lasting a couple years, this can get very, very complicated. And this is when you want your CPA. We're not going to do this in landscape contracting. We're just not. Uh, Because we have a lot of projects going on. And, you know, to be honest with you guys, we hide material cost in other jobs and stuff like that. That's just what we do. But if you're a commercial builder and you've only got like three major projects going on that's lasting you two years, you're going to want to do this type of uh, accounting. All right, with cash management, tough situation here, cash flow. You know, Mr. Moser, our accountant's always said, you know, you can you can bar uh, from Peter to pay Paul for two years. It's called negative cash flow. And he said, you can run on it for two years. But he said, at the end of the two years, it comes tumbling down. And I've seen it happen many a times. And think about it. We don't see these new guys that get into the green industry go out of business the first year. It's usually that second year. It's the running on the negative cash flow. It puts them out at the end of year two. But cash flow, two important aspects of maintaining a positive cash flow are collecting accounts receivable and billing and collecting for current projects. You've got to do your invoicing. And guys, I'm guilty as anybody out there. When I get home, I don't want to do it. Now, on our monthly maintenance contracts, we bill once a month. We do. I'm I'm just used to that. Our cash flow is fine that we can do that. On our landscape jobs, I need to bill a lot sooner. I mean, we, we finished up a job February 1st and 2nd. I didn't send out the invoice till like March 25th. But the homeowner called and said, hey, come get a check. I've got it wrote for you. I just get lazy. It's when I get home or when I get to the office late in the afternoon, I don't want to do that. That's, uh, hey, I'm preaching to the choir, right? I need to be listening to my own lectures when it comes to this. But collecting accounts receivable, correspondence, like if you're having trouble, difficult or difficult time collecting, your correspondence should look professional with the services rendered and the amount due clearly displayed on your invoice. Follow-up invoices should be sent on a regular schedule. This will convey that you are serious about receiving prompt payment. If the account falls delinquent for more than three months, a stern letter outlining the consequences for non-payment should accompany your follow-up invoices. And if you find you are having problems collecting on accounts receivable, you may want to hire a professional collection agency. Now, I got a friend in the Greensboro area. I'm not going to mention uh, his name. I love him to death. He's very loud and proud and uh, and very cocky and arrogant uh, is what a lot of people have told me. But they just don't know him like I do. But if he doesn't get paid within two to three days on one of the outdoor kitchens that he does, he's knocking on the door and he's standing out there. I'm not leaving until I get a check. I'm not that way. I'm just not. 
I couldn't do that. I mean, he's very threatening and very like, hey, I'm going to whoop your butt if you don't pay me. I'm more of doing this right here, sending out the letters, sending out the invoices, and then on you know month three, hey, we need to collect. With billing and collecting for current projects, prompt billing for current projects is important to receive in timely payments. That's what I need to tell myself, guys. And once you receive the approval for partial or final payment, you should immediately send an invoice requesting payment. The payment should clearly outline payment terms. Get a contract. I paid 1500 bucks to our lawyer to write up our standardized contract and then $300 for each additional addendum to it. So we have our standard contract. And then if I'm going to do a design, which you know, just straight landscape design, landscape architecture project, you know, here is the addendum that attaches to the back. If we're doing, you know, hardscapes, we have one for hardscapes. We have one for our Christmas lighting business. So the addendums were extra $1,500 for the general contract up front, which lays out everything that we are wanting done. You know, I think it's seven or eight pages. And then the addendum is a one page attachment at the end. It was well worth the money. And with bad debts, if you notice that the amount of accounts receivable is increasing, you may need to adjust your collection procedures. Just don't do what my friend does. Let's go beat some doors down. But progress payments, partial payments made after uh, specified phases of construction are complete. So you may want to get, you know, a down payment. Then you may want to get, you know, partial payment at 50% complete. And then, you know, so many days after final completion, you want to get paid. Payment for lump sum contracts, they're calculated by the percentage of work completed. Your payment for unit price contracts based on the actual work units completed. So let's say you're doing, you know, a 10,000 square foot, um, you know, paver patio. Once you get 2,500 square feet done, you may request payment. Payment for cost plus contracts is based on actual cost rather than a percentage of completed work. So you're going to have to keep, you know, good records for that uh, because you're going to show them exactly what it costs and then you're doing a cost plus. And then final payment should include the final payment amount plus any retainages owed. With the North Carolina prompt pay law, prime contractor payment. This is the general contractor. And I know a lot of you guys act as general contractors, especially like on outdoor kitchens and and big hardscape projects. But the prime contractor payment must be made within 45 days after completion of the project. The GC or the landscape contractor needs to get paid 45 days after completion. You know, hopefully it's a lot sooner, but you know, it takes 30, 60, 90 days on some of these GC payments. Project delays. If the project is delayed by the fault of the contractor, the project may be occupied without payment or interest past the 45 day limit. Interest. If final payment is delayed past the 45 days, the prime contractors do 1% interest per month on the unpaid balance. We don't get paid from builders like that, do we? But no, this is the prime contractor. And you got to understand that the prime contractor can be a general contractor. It can be a uh, HVAC contractor. It could be an electrical contractor. It could be an ele- a licensed landscape contractor. Prime is the head honcho in charge. So we've worked on many uh, jobs where there have been multiple prime contractors. We actually work for the general contractor, though, who is one of the primes. And then if the electrical is way, you know, is too much, to, um, is a large project, then the electrical contractor becomes a prime contractor as well as the HVAC, especially on state jobs and working for uh, colleges and, and public uh, buildings they're not going to want to have the GC oversee the electrical or HVAC because the cost gets too much. They don't want to add that builder's percentage to already, you know, a high percentage of the building cost. Uh, Subcontractor payments, payments to subs by the prime contractor must be made within seven days of the periodic or final payment receipt. So when that GC gets paid, he has to pay you within seven days. And then the subcontractor retainage. Retainage for subcontractors cannot exceed the retainage percentage withheld from prime contractors. So if the GC submits their bill to the owner and the GC uh, is paid, but there is a retainage held for it, 
they can't hold more retainage from you more so than what they've been withheld from. So if they're holding 10% on the builder, he can only hold 10% on your final payment for retainage. Guidelines for payment of subcontractors. Again, subcontractor payments, payment to the sub by the prime contractor must be made within seven days of receiving a periodic or final payment. Interest begins on the eighth day, 1% interest per month on the unpaid balance is due and grounds for withholding payment unsatisfactory job progress, defective construction not remediated, disputed work, third-party claims filed or reasonable evidence that a claim will be filed, failure of the sub to make timely payments for labor, equipment, materials, and damage to the contractor or another subcontractor, and reasonable amount of retainage not to exceed the initial percentage retained by the owner. Man, a lot said in that right there. But guys, this is how we get paid. And this is how we need to pay our subs if we are hiring subcontractors. With Petty Cash Fund, these are small payments made without writing a check. You're keeping, you know, $100, $200 in a lockbox in your office if you need to go and get, you know, small things, you know, such as, you know, pens or paper from Office Depot. It is important to document these expenditures and should be balanced and replenished monthly. So you got to keep record of it. Equipment records and accounting. Uh, for accounting purposes, information on equipment must be tracked. Important information to record includes the use rate, how much you're charging per hour, the use time, how much you've used it, your maintenance cost for it, the repair cost, if any, and your operating cost. How much does it cost to have fuel in it? How much are you having to pay the operator to drive the machine? Those are all your operating costs. And with the depreciation method, this is the process of devaluing a fixed asset as a result of aging, wear and tear, or it's just obsolete. There, are, there is straight line depreciation, which is the initial asset cost minus the salvage cost is your depreciation cost. Your depreciation cost divided by the useful life years is your yearly depreciation amount. With accelerated depreciation, this is the asset that's depreciated at a higher rate during the early part of its useful life, permitting larger tax deductions. And a lot of people are taking advantage of this right now, uh, you know, with all the COVID restrictions and everything else. You can you can pretty much depreciate, I think, a piece of equipment or a truck. I think still maybe the whole thing the first year. Uh, modified accelerated cost recovery system, your MACRS allows for faster depreciation over longer periods. But again, talk to your CPA on that. They will hook you right up. Uh, with shipping and delivery expenses, FOB uh, frayed uh, prepaid, this is when the buyer is going to pay for the freight. FOB freight allowed, this is where the buyer will pay the freight, but usually the, the seller will credit them back on the actual merchandise, uh, the cost of the shipping. And then with your payment terms, depends on the payment agreement between the buyer and the selling or seller. With payroll, the process for preparing payroll. I'm going to stop right here when it comes to this. Guys, if you're not using a payroll service, get on board. And trust me, even if you're a sole proprietor and you are your only employee, I would still do payroll service for myself because it's going to handle all the taxes for me. And I would set it up where I paid myself once a month. That way I'd only have to pay, you know, the 60 bucks for them to do all of the taxes and I get all this stuff at the end of the year. It's one less thing I have to do. Trust me, it's worth 60 bucks a pay period. But the process for preparing payroll, you need to calculate your gross pay for each employee, calculate and deduct the applicable taxes and other deductions, and then calculate net pay and issue checks, and then update the payroll journal. Now, long time ago, when I was married to the girl's mom, she called me one day and she said, you need to get here. I'm like, what's going on? And this was when I was primarily building houses. And, you know, we still had the landscape company going on, but I was more tied up in the home building section. And um, we wrote ourselves a payroll check out of QuickBooks. We did payroll ourselves with, with QuickBooks. And I downloaded the wrong tax table. 
And I got off, you know, in about six, seven, eight months, something during that time frame, I owed, I think, about $2,000 that I'd got off track. And my wife called me and she said, you need to get here. She called me on the next tail. Remember the old next tails? And she said, uh, you need to hurry up and get here. I'm like, why? What's going on? She said, the IRS is here. I, I thought she was, I thought she was joking. But nope. She said, they're, they're here. There's two big black Suburbans tinted out. They're all dressed like men in black, you know, the movie. And they had a federal ID badge and a sidearm. And they're like, we're here to collect payroll tax. I'm like, whoa. Really? I said, I've been paying it. Well, yes, Mr. Jones, we see that you've been paying it. You just got off a little bit, and we're here to collect that $2,000 plus interest. I'm like, wow. <laughs> I'm like, well, I don't have it right now. I can write you a check or whatever. They're like, we'll take a check. And so I had to clear that right up. But, you know, when people say the IRS don't come knocking at the door, pfft, believe me, they do. And, you know, it, it, it got me a little nervous. But, you know, I was honest with them. They knew I was honest. I just made an honest mistake. So, uh, again, that's why I love the payroll service because anytime like that, you know, anything like that shows up ever again, I'm like, Hey, look, you need Here's the ADP payroll phone number. Uh, calculating gross pay is determined by a salary that you set for the employee, uh, based on an hourly wage, multiply the number of hours worked. And so guys, we know this, this is, this is review because we all have employees that we have to pay. We'll calculate and deduct the applicable taxes and deductions like Social Security tax, Medicare tax, and advanced earned income credit, your state income tax, and then any other deductions. And what about those child support letters that you get, you know, six months after the guy's already left? Happens all the time. I've got one that I've got to fill out now. I've already filled it out for him once in Florida. Now, they're wanting me to fill out another one for here in North Carolina. He's the guy that actually, on the brand new Isuzu truck that we had, you know, we filled up. Uh, uh, we had well, we hadn't filled up with diesel, but we stopped down there to get some debt fuel. And he's like, "Man, I'll take that out there and put it out and go out there." And the idiot had poured it in the diesel tank, not the debt, not the debt tank. And I'm like, "My God, are you that?" stupid and yes he was that stupid and he just laughed and said i guess i ruined a seventy thousand dollar truck my bad take it out of my check and i just wanted to i wanted to punch him in the nose man you know and then now i'm still you know a year and a half later still dealing with child support stuff where the dude's got like four kids and ain't paid a penny in years um i mean just the kind of people that we run across in this business right but we'll calculate net pay and issue the checks. Your gross pay minus the taxes and deductions is the net pay. And then update your payroll journal once the checks are issued. Technology solutions for accounting. There are many accounting software programs on the market that can help make the accounting process easier. Accounting a software can automate the process of posting transactions, creating financial statements, invoicing customers, and creating purchase orders and much more. When choosing the right software, consider what your needs are and how the technology can grow with your company. Now, I recommend QuickBooks. I recommend LMN Software. I love them both. Uh, it, it's one of those things, guys. You, you need to make the investments for these programs. They're going to help your your program or your. they're going to make your business run a whole lot smoother. Now, LMN has come out with LMN Grow. If you're a new entrepreneur or you're you know very small uh, with one or two employees, LMN Grow, you can access here on your phone. And it's a simple, simple thing to do. I highly, highly recommend it. With your employer identification number, before you become an employer and hire employees, you need a federal employer identification number or EIN. Once you form your corporation, you can do it immediately. You know, you can go right to the IRS's website and get it within a matter of minutes. They'll email it to you. The only entities that do not need an EIN are sole proprietors that have no employees and file no excise or pension tax returns. And LLCs with a single owner where the owner will file employment tax returns. These are the two things which, you know, you're going to pass through on your personal tax return. LLCs can actually choose to be taxed at a corporation level or a sole proprietor level. And then sole proprietors can only file through 
through their personal tax returns. I highly recommend being an incorporation or an LLC. And again, I'm not an attorney or an accountant. You need to sit down and talk with those two professionals and see what's best for you. Uh, with federal business taxes, the form of business you operate determines what taxes you must pay and how you pay them. The following are three general types of business taxes that you must be responsible for. Income tax, self-employment tax, and employment taxes. So, you know, the income tax that your company makes, you know, it may pass through if you're in uh, LLC or S corporation, C corporation are going to pay two, uh, two, uh, uh, two taxes, uh, and that's why a lot of people uh, elect to go subchapter S on the uh, the corporation, so they can avoid that double taxation. Self employment tax, you know, that's your uh, your FICA and Medicare for yourself, and then employment taxes on what you have to pay uh, for your employees working for you. You have to match what they're putting in. Income tax, all businesses except partnerships must file an annual income tax, retec, uh, tax return. Your partnerships will file an information return because they're going to file their taxes through their social security number, their personal tax returns. And then the form you use depends on how your business is organized. And we have a lecture on the YouTube page all about, um, you know, which business entity. All it does is talk about the pros and cons of each. But again, you need to speak with a CPA or an accountant uh, or your attorney to see what see which is better for you. With self-employment tax, self-employment tax is a Social Security and Medicare tax primarily for individuals who work for themselves. Your payments of self-employment tax contribute your coverage under the Social Security system. With Social Security coverage provides you with retirement benefits, disability benefits, survivor benefits, and hospital insurance. You must pay the self-employment tax and file Schedule SE if your net earnings from self-employment uh, were more than $400. You must also pay self-employment tax on your share of certain partnership income and your guaranteed payments if you're in a partnership. And most landscape contractors don't do uh, partnerships. I've only known of two my entire life uh, since I've been teaching these classes. And, you know, with, with uh, you know, friends of mom and dad that were, uh, uh, one of them was a partner, and then I've talked to a partner in these classes. But with your federal employment taxes, where you have employees, you have certain employment tax responsibilities and forms you must file. Most employers must withhold, accept, FUTA, uh, deposit, report, and pay the following taxes. Social Security and Medicare taxes or FICA, federal income tax withholding, and federal unemployment FUTA tax. So there's a lot that we've got to do. And you know what? The payroll service does it for you. I enter the hours that each employee has and it takes out their taxes and then it charges me the taxes with it and they submit the they submit the funds to the state and the federal i don't have to do none of that all of it is taken off my plate and i love it with Circular E, this is a comprehensive reference providing thorough instructions on calculating, withholding, and depositing employee taxes. You can go to the IRS Gov or nasclaforms.org and see the Circular E reference. With Social Security and Medicare taxes, FICA, uh, pay for the benefits that workers and families receive under the Federal Insurance Contributions Act or FICA. And Social Security tax pays for the benefits under the Old Age Survivors and Disability Insurance Part of FICA. Medicare tax pays for benefits under the hospital insurance part of FICA. So, you know, this is uh, a good thing, guys. We just have to do it. And we, that's why we have to have higher labor rates working for our customers so we can actually pay this stuff. It drives me crazy when I hear a landscape contract, man, I pay my guys under the table, so I ain't got to pay that darn taxes. I'm, you know, when somebody says that to me, I immediately turn my back and walk away. Guys, we're all responsible for it. Do it and do the right thing. With federal employment taxes, the withholding, you generally must withhold federal income tax from your employees' wages. To figure out how much to withhold, use the employee's Form W-4 and the employee's withholding allowance certificate and methods described in previous chapters of the NASCLA textbook that we use on campus. 
with your deposit schedule. There are three deposit schedules, monthly, semi-weekly, and daily. Prior to the beginning of the calendar year, you must determine which schedule you are required to use. You are a monthly schedule depositor if your total payroll tax liability for the previous four quarters was $50,000 or less. You're doing it monthly. If you accumulate a tax liability as $100,000 or more on any day during a deposit period, you must deposit it on the next banking day. If you report less than $2,500 for the quarter, you can use the IRS Form 941 Quarterly Employer's Tax Return to make payments by the due date of the return. I get something from the state and the federal government. I get this Form 941 all the time. And it's where I had an employee for Turf Teacher, Inc. a while back, and they left and, and moved on. And so I had to stop payroll service because I wasn't using it. And so I'm, I'm having to fill out these Form 941s all the time with a zero and, and writing across no employees. I'm doing exactly what my accountant says, and I mail it back to him. And he said, it might take five years, but they'll finally get the point that you have no more employees. With your FUTA, your federal unemployment tax, this is part of the federal and state program under the Federal Unemployment Tax Act, FUTA, that pays unemployment compensation to workers who lose their jobs. You are generally liability or liable for both state and federal unemployment taxes if your wage, your pay wages to employees totaling fifteen hundred or more in any quarter of the calendar year, and you had at least one employee during any day of a week during twenty weeks in the calendar year, regardless of whether or not the weeks were consecutive. They're fixing it where you got to have to pay it. Just do it. The FUTA tax base and FUTA rate is calculated on the current prevailing rate. And then report FUTA taxes on Form 940, the employer's annual federal unemployment FUTA tax return. Or if you qualify, you can use the simpler Form 940EZ. Guess what? I don't have to do none of this because I use a payroll service. Penalties. Accurate and prompt deposits are required to avoid penalties, which can range from 2% to 100% of your tax liability. Penalties may apply if you do not make payroll tax deposits on time, make deposits for less than the required amount, and do not use the electronic federal tax payment system EFTPS when required. With the 1099 miscellaneous, you may be required to file information returns to report certain types of payments made during the year to persons not treated as employees. Form 1099 miscellaneous must be filed by January 31st for the prior year's payments. Now, this is for the subcontractors you use. Now, don't tell me that you're 1099 and your employees that show up every day at 8 o'clock and use your equipment and you can tell them when they can take a day off. If they are a 1099, they are an independent contractor, an entrepreneur just like yourself, and they don't have to work that day. They don't, they don't have to. They are on their time calendar, not yours. So be careful. Be careful when hiring an employee and giving them a 1099. With the tax calendar, by January 31st, you need to furnish the W-2 form, the wage and tax statement to all employees, furnish Form 1099 to each other payee, file Form 940 or 940-EZ, the employer's annual federal unemployment tax, and then file Form 945, the annual return of withholding federal income tax. By February 15th, request a new W-4 from employees claiming a tax withholding exemption. And then on February 16th, exempt the W-4 form forms expire. By March 31st, file electronic forms 1099 and 827 with the IRS. And then file electronic W-2 forms with the Social Security Administration. And again, what am I doing? I'm using a payroll service. By April 30th, July 31st, October 31st, and January 31st, you need to deposit FUTA taxes, file Form 941, the employer's quarterly federal tax return, and deposit any undeposited income, Social Security, and Medicare taxes. Before December 1st, remind employees to submit new W-4 forms if withholding allowances have changed. And on December 31st, W-5 form, the Earned Income Credit Advance Payment Certificate expires. With the North Carolina state tax specifics, 
Your corporate income tax, this is the corporate income tax rate in North Carolina is 6.9%. With tax credits, the North Carolina provides several credits for new and expanding business that may be taken against corporate income tax. It's best to consult a tax professional when determining which credits apply to your business. And with your estimated tax, this is a declaration of estimated tax must be filed by a corporation for each taxable year in which it can resemble reasonably expect a state income income tax liability of $500 or more. With franchise tax, it's $1.50 per thousand, minimum of $35. Your sales and use tax, 4.75% state and 2% local rate of tax, which is 6.7%. It may be up now, guys. I'm I'm using this data from the NASCAR book, uh, which I just took a North Carolina business law test uh, about a year and a half ago. Withholding tax, you must submit a completed business registration application to obtain a withholding tax ID number, and each employee must furnish you with a signed North Carolina Employees Withholding Allowance Certificate Form North Carolina 4. Withholding tax returns are filed on quarterly, monthly, and semi-weekly basis. There is a 10% penalty for late payment of tax due. Now, that is wrapping up our lecture on landscape contractor accounting course number 2187. Okay, so you've just finished watching 2187 landscape contractor accounting. And as you've noticed, the check on learning questions are different than what's in the lecture. And so when you open up the quiz, this is what you're going to see, guys. And so what is the turf teacher's accountant's first name? It is Arnold, Arnold Moser to be exact, A-R-N-O-L-D. And what is the name of the turf teacher's dogs? I have two dogs. So depending on which question pops up, it could either be Shiloh or Sergeant. That's Shiloh or Sergeant. And what year did the turf teacher have his heart attack? It was in 2014. So I apologize for the inconvenience, but this will help you score that good score, which will generate your proof of attendance. Thanks, guys, and I'll see you in the next lecture.